Staff Room Monologues, in association with the National Union of Teachers. What would Buddha have done is a surprisingly effective and gentle piece um, about the preponderance of testing and inspection that goes on in schools these days. Um, it's very confidently written by an RE teacher from Surrey and I hope you enjoy it. I'm an RE teacher. I don't tell many people that. Well, it's the kiss of death at parties. What do you do? I'm a teacher. That's bad enough. What do you teach? RE. So then they either change the subject out of sheer embarrassment or tell me about how marvellous Richard Dawkins is and how true it is that religion is all biologically determined. Funny, really when they're all so desperate to get their kids into St Mary's. My Year 8 class, I really love them. They haven't turned yet. They're still enthusiastic, but not in a silly Year 7 way. Shall I underline the date? They're not the kind of class you come across very often. They love the subject, and they love me, and they'll do whatever I want them to. It cheers me up after year 11 and religion and life. And do we have to do this subject? It doesn't get you a job, does it? Last week, I had a great discussion with year eight about Christmas. At first, when I asked them how Christmas had gone, they all said, great, got lots of cool presents, got computer for the bedroom, that sort of thing. But then we talked a bit more and they started to say how Christmas isn't the same as it was when they were little. That the thrill of the presents wears off. And that what they really enjoy is the whole family sitting down together for a meal for once. And the discussion felt real. I hadn't planned it, it just happened. In fact, they're the reason I'm sitting here waiting for her. She's had meetings all day and she can only fit me in after school. And obviously she's running late. She'll be out in a minute with a great insincere smile on her face. Oh, Lynn, I'm so sorry to keep you waiting. Hope you didn't want to rush off tonight. That discussion about Christmas was a preparation for our module on Buddhism. I wanted them to think about if they could free themselves from a longing for the latest iPod or whatever. To be honest, most of them said no. But a few got the idea, and so to reinforce it, I decided that next lesson we'd do colouring in a mandala. Oh, that's the pattern that Buddhist monks make in sand and then destroy. You mustn't get attached to anything, you see. Not even beautiful patterns. I give the class a mandala on paper, of course. They colour it in beautifully, and then I ask them to tear it up. And after a bit of a struggle, they do, and point made. So I planned the lesson, photocopied the mandalas, got some extra felt tip pens, and told them they had to do exactly as I told them and not ask any questions. They liked that bit of mystery. Away they go, colouring in with ferocious concentration and always going swimmingly until... <sighs> I suppose I should have remembered that Mr Briefcase might pop in. I had hoped he'd be with Sarah, the head of department, all day, but I suppose she sent him to observe Year 8, knowing what a well-behaved class they are. So in he comes, looks straight at the board. No aims or objectives, obviously, because I don't want them to know where the lesson's going. Frowns slightly. Frowns even more when there's no chair for him. But eventually we all settle down again. 
I'm quite nervous by this time. And so the class is unsettled. Why don't observers ever realise that their presence upsets that delicate balance between class and teacher? You'd think they'd have heard of Einstein. Anyway, I decide to carry on. And after about half an hour, I tell them to stop colouring in, which they do with some reluctance. Mr B frowns again. Too much time spent on one activity, obviously. I ask the best behaved pupil to come to the front of the class and beaming with pride, she shows her pattern to everyone. She explains her choice of colours, what they mean to her and then I tell her to tear it up and put it in the bin. And there is an audible gasp from everyone. Alice at the front looks at me with disbelief, tears welling in her eyes. She struggles between obeying me and her feelings of delight in her pattern. And then she's quite overcome and starts to cry and the whole class sobs in sympathy. What could I do? Especially with him sitting there. It's OK, Alice, I said. Your pattern is very beautiful. It's nice to be attached to beautiful things. Gradually, the sobbing subsided. I handed out textbooks and they made notes on the early life of Buddha. Mr B frowned again. He didn't say much at the end of the lesson. and just went straight out to find Sarah. No lesson aims, no plenary, no pupil progress, changing the point of the lesson halfway through. Well, they're going to send me on a course, aren't they? I love my job. It's the only subject where you can talk about things. Life. It's what English should be, rather than can you include a subordinate clause in your first paragraph. I'm good at it. I know I am. I'd like to see him in front of a class. If I had to leave, it would break my heart. But what could I do? What would you do? What would the Buddha have done? My name is Susie Paskins and I'm a part-time teacher of RE and Critical Thinking at a girls' school in Surrey. I heard about the competition in the NUT magazine. It was a, a couple of lines and it sounded quite intriguing. And then I thought about it and I thought, OK, I'll do something about it. There were about two days to go, so I sat down and I wrote it very quickly. We can give you a little while there if you like. Sorry, no, I'm fine. Sorry about that. Yeah. A terrible frog in my throat. I think there were two things in my mind when I um, wrote the story. Uh, one is because I'm coming up to retirement, I was thinking very much about creative lessons in the classroom and how they're a little bit dangerous because they may not go as you want them to. And the other thing I was thinking about was that how any teacher's relationship with her class is influenced by the presence of an observer sitting at the back. Um, and then I thought, OK, I'll put these two ideas together, that the teacher's right in the middle of this lesson, which is very much on the knife edge, and then someone comes in and it doesn't quite work as she would wish it to, and there are consequences that follow from that. Action. I'm an RE teacher. Sorry, just cut. 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 I think teaching has changed a great deal. Um, perhaps not the rapport of the teacher with the class and what the teacher is trying to do, but um, the amount of monitoring has changed a great deal. I think teachers are trusted less than they used to be.
This is the first piece of creative writing I've done since school, so I'm really very thrilled to uh, be one of the winners. <laughs> I think it's benefited my professional development in the sense that it's really made me think about what's valuable in, in teaching. I've thought back over my very long experience of, of teaching and um, I think the, the creativity in the classroom, the rapport with the class, the, the feeling that you're getting over a new idea that they haven't heard about before, that you're perhaps challenging their stereotypes, you're talking about something that's real. Um, that's what I've been thinking about and I was very glad to be able to sit down and write about it. And I handed out textbooks. They made notes on the early life of suburbia. <laughs> I think this sort of competition is, is really exciting for teachers because I think the ordinary classroom teacher often doesn't have a voice in what's happening. And the terrific response has shown that, you know, teachers want to be heard and have got things to say.